Big thanks to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. Check out a free trial of Skillshare Premium by clicking the link in the description below. Hey everyone, Path here, and in this video I want to discuss a rather interesting concept known as imaginary time, a concept that Stephen Hawking once said he wished more people knew about. As always, we'll try and keep the mathematics as simple as possible, so if you do enjoy this video then please do hit the thumbs up button and subscribe for more fun physics content. Let's get into it. The first thing to understand is that imaginary time, as cool as it sounds, does not refer to anything in our imaginations or anything of that sort. It's called imaginary time because it's directly related to the imaginary number i, which is defined to be the square root of negative 1. Engineers sometimes call this quantity j, but I will be using the physicist convention and sticking with i. Now, if you're already familiar with imaginary and complex numbers, feel free to skip to this timestamp here. If you're not so familiar with imaginary numbers, then it might seem strange that we can take the square root of a negative number. To understand this, let's first imagine taking the square root of a positive number. When we do this, the result is another number on the real number line. For example, the square roots of plus 9 are plus 3 and minus 3, the square roots of plus 4 are plus 2 and minus 2, and the square roots of plus 1 are plus 1 and minus 1. But taking the square root of a negative number, we're not allowed to do that, are we? Well, as it turns out, there is a branch of mathematics that deals with what happens if we define the square root of a negative number to be something. Not a number on the real number line that we've seen already, but instead a different kind of number, known as an imaginary number. Using the real number line we already have here, the new kind of number that we're talking about is most easily demonstrated using a different axis. The numbers on this axis are essentially multiples of this imaginary number i, which itself is the square root of minus 1, and therefore this new axis is known as the imaginary axis. Here is an example of how this new axis works. If we think about a conventional square root, the square root of a positive number like 36, we obviously know that the square root of 36 is 6, but we could also choose to write the square root of 36 as the square root of 4 multiplied by 9. And we can also equivalently write this as the square root of 4 multiplied by the square root of 9, which ends up being 2 multiplied by 3, which is 6. And of course, plus or minus, we have to account for both possibilities. But we can do a similar sort of thing when taking the square root of something like minus 4, for example. We can write minus 4 as 4 times minus 1, and then we can write this entire expression as the square root of 4 multiplied by the square root of minus 1. This allows us to basically find the square root of any negative number because we know that the square root of minus 1 is defined to be i. So in this case, we find our solutions to be plus 2i and minus 2i. So that is a basic description of how we work with imaginary numbers. And we can also represent numbers that are a blend of real and imaginary numbers by displaying them on this kind of argand diagram, as it's known. We create a mixed number, a complex number, by adding a real part and an imaginary part. So for example, the number 2 plus 3i is a complex number represented on the argand diagram like this. And another complex number, minus 3 plus 2i, can be represented like this, for example. But it's worth noting that all of these terms, real, imaginary, complex, are just terms. They're just names that have been made up by people. They don't really correlate to our everyday use of the word real, imaginary, and complex. So let's keep that in mind. And let's now take a look at the concept of imaginary time. As you may have guessed, imaginary time has nothing to do with our imaginations and everything to do with imaginary numbers, the ones that we've just discussed. Imaginary time at its core is a pretty basic idea. If we see a variable representing time in any of our mathematical calculations, we can replace it with this instead, the imaginary number i multiplied by tau. In other words, we're replacing something usually real with something imaginary now. And tau basically is just a number that allows this equation to be true. And we'll see why this is useful in a second, but it's worth me mentioning that this kind of substitution, where we take something real and substitute in something imaginary, is known as a wick rotation. This is named after Giancarlo Wick. The reason this is known as a Wick rotation is most easily described if we look back at our Argon diagram from earlier. Going from something real to something imaginary, or from something imaginary to something real, requires a rotation on the Argon diagram, and hence this kind of substitution is known as a Wick rotation. Now, before we go any further, I'd like to thank this video's sponsor, Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community where you can find a large number of inspiring classes focusing on topics such as productivity and lifestyle, to building a business, to learning creative skills.
Many of you may know that one of my hobbies is creating music. Check out my music channel linked below. And I've taken some classes on Skillshare that have taught me some really cool skills. For example, I took a class called Audio Mixing on the Go, Professional Sound Without the Studio by King Arthur, which gave me lots of tips for improving my mixes without lots of fancy equipment. And that's the key here. Skillshare has a large number of classes to choose from, and it's all about learning, so there are no adverts. And Skillshare costs less than $10 a month with an annual subscription. But the first 1,000 of you to click the first link in the description box below will get a free trial of Skillshare Premium. Please do go check it out, and big thanks to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. Now, let's get back to the imaginary time substitution t is equal to i tau. This kind of wick rotation is primarily useful in the study of relativity as a mathematical tool. For example, some of you may be familiar with the idea that in special relativity with Minkowski spacetime, if we consider two events that happen at different points in space and at different points in time, we can find a quantity known as the interval between these two events. This is a four-dimensional extension of finding the distance between two points in three-dimensional space, for example. If we call the interval that we're trying to find ds, then we can relate ds to the spatial distance between the two events in the x-direction, y-direction, z-direction, and the time interval between these two events as well. The relationship in question looks something like this. Notice that the spatial part just looks like we've applied Pythagoras' theorem in three dimensions, which essentially is exactly what we've done. But the time part of this equation looks a little bit different. It has the opposite sign to the spatial parts. Now, for an explanation as to why we work with the interval between two events, check out my relativity playlist down below, and I'll also leave some useful resources in the description. But if we now take the expression for this interval, and we make the imaginary time substitution, t is equal to i tau, we see that the negative sign for the time part of this expression goes away. Now the mathematics of this expression looks a bit like a four-dimensional extension of Pythagoras' theorem. If we had four spatial dimensions, then this is how we'd find the spatial distance between these two events. This makes the whole mathematics much easier to deal with and can actually allow us to find certain solutions that would have been very tricky without making the imaginary time substitution. Now, Stephen Hawking took this idea of imaginary time and extended it a bit further, much more than just a little mathematical convenience. He proposed that maybe in the past, early in the universe, time could have not just real values, but imaginary ones as well. This allowed him to play around with the idea of cause and effect and the passage of time in a single direction. The reason he proposed that time may have been allowed to have imaginary values in the past was because most of our current theories suggest to us that the universe began with a region of infinite density at the Big Bang. In other words, everything in our universe was concentrated on an infinitesimally small point. And unfortunately, infinities in our maths make life a little bit difficult for physicists. And it turns out that allowing time to take both real and imaginary values would have sorted out this infinity. This is why the idea of imaginary time was so appealing. However, as I understand it, Stephen Hawking believed that this hypothesis of his was not testable in any way. We have no way of working out or testing whether in the past time was allowed to have imaginary values as well as real ones, because he assumed that the imaginary component was lost at some point in the past in the early universe. Also, other scientists have found it difficult to justify this imaginary time hypothesis with observations of our real universe, which is why this is a really interesting idea to think about, but not necessarily one we can take much further at this point. And still, the use of imaginary time as a mathematical tool remains. That's not going anywhere. Wick rotations are still useful in problem solving and can actually help us transform the mathematics of one branch of physics into another as well. By the way, as an aside, some of you have asked me if I ever met Stephen Hawking because I was lucky enough to study at the same institution at which he was teaching. Sadly, I never got the opportunity to meet him, although I do know a few friends that did and said he was very cool. And with all of that being said, I'm going to finish up here. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please do hit the thumbs up button and subscribe for more fun physics content. Hit that bell button if you'd like to be notified when I upload and please do check out my Patreon page if you'd like to support me on there. Thank you so much for watching as always and I'll see you very soon. Bye.